Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. And you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into our store and give you guys about a two to four minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff that is out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. Okay, remember the format of this video is we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. First off, I have a Springfield First Generation XD. Now this particular one was brought into the store by a gentleman who is not actually local here. We had a uh, gun show, really large, or the largest gun show that we have here in central Indiana is the Indy 1500 Gun and Knife Show. Uh, over the past year due to COVID, they were not running the show and this was the first time that they've had in about a year. So it got a lot of attention, you know, from people around the surrounding areas and states. Uh, we had a gentleman who was not local here who had come into town for the gun show and was planning on taking this pistol into the show to try and sell there. Uh, but he was actually a viewer of the channel and decided to come into my store since he was in the area and decided to sell it to me, which I really appreciate. And I wanted to also include this in the video as I know he wanted to see it in here. So thank you again for bringing this in and selling it to me. It's a really cool pistol. As many of you guys I'm sure have seen the Springfield XD. Now later or more lately on the market, there has been the XD and the XD Mod 2, but this is where it all started. Now this was actually formerly known as the HS2000 and it was a Croatian design, which would enter Croatian military service in about 1999, replacing the PHP MV9, which itself is sort of a variation or a hybrid, if you look at it, uh, related to like the P38 and the Beretta M9. So this would sort of be the first, you know, polymer frame uh, pistol from that era. Now, in about 2000, the year 2000, a, co a company called Intrac would import, the, import these into the United States again under the same designation HS2000 in 9mm. Now the funny thing was is they had a price point on the market at about the $300 price range and they were not actually that great of a seller. Now what changed everything was Springfield in 2002 bought the rights to these and they would still be manufactured in Croatia but they would put the name XD and Springfield on the firearm, XD standing for Extreme Duty rebranding the pistol and then selling it at a price point of about $500 and they couldn't make enough of them to sell. So that's just the power of branding and marketing for you. Um, and since then, the XD line has been a staple on the US firearm consumer market, you know, ever since. Again, they've come up with new designs like the XDM, the XD Mod 2, the subcompact versions, the XDS, the XDE. So it's really an all a line that started off with this Croatian design. And I would say is probably one of the top tier or the one of the most selling polymer frame pistol lines in the U.S. market. So just kind of an interesting history there. Uh, I'm sure uh, many of you may even have HS2000 pistols. It's really essentially the same thing, just with different markings on it. Now, this one here is a 40. Uh, the uh, previous owner did get a 9mm barrel and uh, magazine to change the caliber on it. This does have night sights on it, so it's a nice caliber conversion pistol. Now, traditionally the market on these since they would uh, come out with the newer variations before all the craziness in the market, you could typically pick up one of these used for about the two to $300 mark. They've kind of crept up to maybe about the $400 mark. The, the M's and the Mod 2's have crept up to about the $500 mark on the used market. So uh, definitely still a good pistol. And again, for three to $400, a really nice polymer frame, lightweight ergonomic pistol, really known for reliability. And it is technically a military and police service pistol. Really, really good purchase. So uh, again, thank you for bringing that into the store. It's a really cool pistol, nice with the conversion, the two different caliper mags and everything. And back when they used to sell these things new, you would get the gear package, like the holster and the, and the speed loader and all that stuff, which they've kind of done away with in the hard case. This is just a really nice early first gen Springfield XD. So there's that one for you. Okay, now up next, I have a really nice follow on to a firearm we had on last week's video, which was the Yugoslavian M44 Mauser. Now, if you remember from last week's video, the M44 was actually a leftover or surplus German K98K from World War II, which Yugoslavia, they had pushed into military service until it would be replaced by the 2447 or the M48, which is what this is here. Now, the M48 was Yugoslavia's you know, first at home uh, designed and built copy, if you will, of the German Mauser action. 
which is what you have here. And there's really no parts interchangeability between this and the K98 Mauser. Now, these also are chambered in eight millimeter Mauser, just like all the other Mauser variants that Yugoslavia would adopt and use. And this would stay as their service sidearm until it would be replaced by variations of the SKS uh, in the 1950s. Now, on the surplus market, these have always had a lot of interest, mainly due to their price point. So I remember eh, back about five to 10 years ago, you could pick one of these up for about two to $300. Uh, while German Mausers at the same time, you know, original matching ones were still going for up over a thousand, maybe Russian captures are going for about 400, 450, 500. So it was still cheaper to get into than any variation of a German Mauser, but it has the same action, same basic aesthetic look. Uh, same feel and same ammunition. Now these are even creeping up quite a bit. We're seeing the M48 Mausers in good matching surplus condition like this, selling at around the $600 mark. Uh, so that's not unusual. But anyway, the M48 Mauser, really, really good, robust action. Remember, as we mentioned on the M44, just like any uh, of the German standard Mausers, the wood hand, hand guard would stop here leaving the rear sight totally exposed. The quickest way you can tell the difference is the rear sight is totally encompassed by the handguard here. So kind of more of a bulged looking action. You have a flat face to the bolt here as well. And the wood stocks, um, on a lot of the German Mausers, they are a laminated wood. This is just a solid piece. But anyway, really, really nice, smooth Mauser action, which again is going to be cheaper and less expensive than what you would pay for an original German Mauser. But I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen these show up in like surplus videos. Uh, gun shows, gun shops, and that sort of thing. So there's that one. Okay, up next, I have a really cool shotgun from Remington. This is the Remington 870, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's a very popular shotgun. Would probably rival what the Mossberg 500 as being the two most commonly purchased pump action shotguns on the US market. Um, the Remington 870, the story really begins with the Remington Model 31, which would come out in, of course, 1931 and be produced until about the mid to late 40s, just after World War II. Now, the Model 31 was Remington's first side eject pump action shotgun, and it itself would replace the Remington Model 17, which was a John Moses Browning design, which would later go on to Ithaca. Now, the Model 31 was a really nice, really attractive looking shotgun. It had even been uh, considered for US military service in World War II. But at the time, Winchester was in full swing production with the Model 12, which was a much more popular commercial success. It was cheaper to uh, produce, it was cheaper to uh, purchase, and it was, a, it was known for being very rugged and reliable. So Remington could really never beat out on Winchester on the sales with the Model 31. So in the late 1940s, they would go back to the drawing board and come up with a new, less expensive, more robust, and more refined shotgun, which they would come out with in 1950, known as the Remington 870. And the rest is history, as these are still being produced and purchased today, while well, everything with the, the bankruptcy of Remington, uh, they are still very much a coveted and respected shotgun. The 870s have been used extensively in riot gun use, police use, uh, independent commercial use. Uh, so again, one of the most popular shotguns that have been out there on the market. Now remember one of the biggest lessons that a lot of domestic arms manufacturers learned during World War II is the whole idea of standardizing and mass producing firearms with interchangeable parts where you can make them quicker, more effectively, more efficiently, and with more durable manufacturing practices which again was we sort of went through this arms revolution here in the United States over the 1940s with the implementation of new military arms in development and production to meet the large uh, scale demands of World War II. And of course, the 870 is a firearm that was birthed out of that whole manufacturing concept. Now the 870s have come, I mean, just like the Mossberg series, they come in a wide array of different variations, the Express lines, the Wingmaster lines, uh, the different sporting configurations with woodstocks, tactical versions, skeet and trap versions, hunting versions, you know, waterfowl versions. The options are endless. Now, traditionally, the 870 shotgun is typically found around the three to $400 mark in most of its configurations. But when we saw all this craziness start up about a year ago, it was things like the 870 and the Mossberg 500s that were some of the first to fly off the shelves right away, which have left their price point kind of high. Now this being the DM, the detachable magazine, um, uses a five round box mag, which I'm getting at here from a weird angle. If I can get this out of here, I probably need to, here, I'm just gonna do this right. 
and that was really stuck in there with a detachable box magazine. This is similar from the concept of the 500M or the 590M series, excuse me, for the uh, the full length shotgun and the shockwave uh, variations, where the magazine tube is actually cut off and just left as a guide for the pump. Um, things like this I've seen in about the six to seven hundred dollar range uh, as of late, just because again with the bankruptcy of Remington and the fact that these have really flown off the shelves, they've been a little bit tougher to come by. But the 870 is known for a very, very nice, solid action, very simple, very easy to produce, but very reliable shotgun. Um, it is really no wonder why the 870 has been one of the best selling shotguns in the consumer market. So anyway, there is that, an interesting 870 DM. Okay, up next I have a really nice revolver from Smith & Wesson. This is the Smith & Wesson Model 19, also known to some as the Combat Magnum. This is a Performance Center Dash 9 model. The story here would actually begin in the 1930s with the development of the 357 cartridge. Now, in the 1930s, a lot of police and federal agencies were not too happy with the ballistics and the performance of the 38. It was deemed to not be lethal enough, not have enough penetrating power for a lot of the requirements of the service revolvers at that time. Now, there was a gentleman by the name of Elmer Keith who was known as a wildcatter when it came to cartridge testing and development. He was known for taking uh, standard cartridges at the time and overloading them to test their tolerances, to test their pressures, to test their, their ballistics, and also test them against other firearm designs and durability at the time. That's just something he enjoyed doing. Now, through that testing, he would come up with what would eventually lead into the 357 cartridge, which would be adopted by Smith & Wesson and built into their very first 357 Magnum uh, revolver, the Model 27. Now, the Model 27 was built on the end frame, which at the time was Smith & Wesson's largest frame, usually reserved for their very high end or very hot, very powerful cartridges like the 44, the 44 Russian, things like that. So of course it would stand to reason that we have this new really big powerful round, the 357. We need to put it in our more durable frame, the Model 27. Now that would stand uh, through to the 1950s when a uh, gentleman by the name of Bill Jordan who was a, uh, he was in the Marine Corps and he was al also a border agent, retired border agent on the southern border here in the United States. He would think that he would want to come up with what would be the perfect uh, service sidearm for police and military use. Now he began coming up and theorizing with what features the firearm would need to have. First, he really liked the 357 round. He liked the idea of the revolver for reliability and such. Uh, but the thing is that he was really hung up on on the Model 27 was that being on the end frame, it was just too heavy, too large, and too cumbersome to expect a police officer, federal agent, to have to carry around on their belt all day long. He wanted to get the firearm down into the K frame, which he achieved with his concept here, which ended up being the Model 19. Now this is a Model 19 with the blued finish. They make the exact same revolver in the stainless finish called the Model 66, which a lot of you have seen and at the time and still exists to be today, one of the smallest uh, variations of the 357 that they manufacture. Now that was stay in production until 1999 when they would discontinue the Model 19, but then they did bring it back with the classic series, the Performance Center Shop in 2018 until today, which is what this is. So this is made 2018, 19, or 20. It is a really, really nice, easily balanced, really nice balanced, really nice weighted revolver with a six round capacity, double single action. You have a fully shrouded ejector rod here. The sight on the Performance Center is brought back just a little bit and you have a port here on top. Really nice grip panels. I, I'm not sure, I believe this was purchased separately, but the as they come from the factory, you have the Smith & Wesson rubber grips for shooting and then you have this for aesthetic. Just a really, really nice classic revolver. Now the original, uh, as designed by Bill Jordan, was intended to have a four inch barrel, which was a typical service length at the time, but they make them in a variety of barrel lengths today. Pricing, like any other Smith & Wesson revolver, is gonna be all over the board based on the dash variant. And that's basically how they have uh, design changes over a period of time as they change the dash anytime a substantial design change is made. It's really hard to date a Smith & Wesson, but your earlier dash models that are more pure configurations are gonna bring more money. Uh, something like this from the Performance Center, I'm seeing used in about the $1,000 plus range, $1,100-ish $1, range, um, in really good condition in the original box. 
Uh, so just a really, really nice classic revolver, really good weight and balance. And again, the Model 19 has a interesting place in Smith & Wesson's revolver lineup as being again, the first K-Frame 357. So anyway, there is that for you again, the Model 19 Performance Center. Okay, up next I have a really cool shotgun from Fab Arm. This is a Fab Arm STF-12 Professional 12 gauge pump action shotgun. Now for those of you who are into shotguns, the name Fab Arm should ring a bell as they are a manufacturer mainly of hunting and sporting type shotguns. They make really high quality, really high end shotguns. Uh, and they are a company based out of Italy. Now in about 2019, they would come out with this product being its first entrance into the more tactical market. And it was really intended to be marketed directly to police and military and groups, not necessarily the US civilian market. So you have a lot of shotguns out there that have the more tactical feel, but they've actually been built for the mainly the US consumer market to sort of scratch that tactical itch that a lot of us have. It's, they're not necessarily really built with really hard, rugged use in mind, but this was. Um, this has some interesting features. First of all, the overall build construction, it is aluminum receiver with a shrouded barrel. Uh, the overall build, it feels very, very rugged and very, very high quality. I mean, I, you feel like you could drop this thing off a building and it would still work. It's very, very heavy though. It's hefty in weight with a longer barrel and this very thick breacher type muzzle brake and extended magazine too. The stock on it is at about a length of pull of 12 and a half inches. Now that is pretty short for most people. And if you you know do shoulder it, you are gonna feel the, the lower length on that. It's gonna feel like it's really bumping up against your nose on here. The reason for that is the intended user, again, being military or police, it's, it's basically assumed that the user will be wearing some sort of body armor or vest uh, when they're actually employing this in the field. Also, the compact size is great for you know manipulating this in something like a squad car, a SWAT vehicle, or trying to get around tight corners. Pistol grip is very ergonomic. Now, your sighting system is also interesting as well. You have a ghost ring rear and a front post, and then you have two fiber optic uh, sight posts on either side here with the one in the middle. Now, so you have really, really nice adjustable for windage and elevation size on top. You do have a full pick rail if you want to put on an optic. Now, if you do not have a QD mount for your optic and you need to ditch your sights or your optic quickly or reduce the weight of the shotgun, you have this interesting feature that I've never seen done before, but you have a nut here you unthread, turn it over here and it unlocks your rail, and then the whole thing can slide right off your shotgun, thus reducing the weight and giving yourself a set of backup sights, which are on a three dot rifle sight configuration. Really, really cool feature. Now, these are not uh, super inexpensive. They do MSRP around the $1,200 mark, and I'm seeing them used for about $1,000. So it's not horrible for what you're, get, or what you're getting, but you know, there are other things that are similar facsimiles to this type of concept made in Turkey, for example, that you know are three to $400. Uh, but just keep in mind, you are getting something that is not just built to look and feel tactical. It actually is built to serve the purpose of being a combat assault shotgun. So pretty cool in that regard. A really interesting concept, and it's cool that Fab Arm has come out with something to, to meet sort of this police or military service uh, niche and the shotgun market. So really, really cool product. Glad to get one in. I did not actually know too much about them, or I've never had a chance to handle one until I got this one in. So really, really cool. Glad to see this. Okay, up next is a really classic revolver from Smith & Wesson. This is the Smith & Wesson Model 1917 US Service Revolver, chambered in 45 ACP. Now, as many of you would know, the standard issue 1911 did serve as the US standard issue sidearm beginning in World War I and ending its service in the early 1980s as it was replaced by the Beretta M9. Now, backing up to World War I or pre-World War I, the US Army would adopt the, uh, the 1911 handgun which would begin entering service in about 1912. Now, shortly thereafter, the United States would be roped into World War I, where we would quickly find ourselves, and I say we because I'm American, but the US would quickly find themselves in need of war material. There were not enough 1911s that had been produced and were in the, in the arsenal prepared to be issued to everybody who needed a sidearm as they were being shipped over to Europe. What the U.S. military did is they went to Colt and Smith & Wesson and asked for them to come up with a supplemental backup uh, revolver that could be issued alongside the 1911 to fill the need of the, the handgun needs 
of the U.S. military going into the war. Now, of course, the 1911 was chambered in 45 ACP, so they needed the service revolver to be chambered in the same caliber so that there would not be a, an overstretching of the ordnance requirements of need of something like supplying 38 or a 32 or something along those lines. So they could make it standard keep it with a 45 ACP. Now, what Smith & Wesson did is at the time they had the 44 hand eject second model, which they basically slightly revised and came out with this. It was a pretty quick uh, way for them to introduce this model. Colt also had a model 1917. They're similar in size, but uh, there are a lot of functional differences between the two. Now, the 45 ACP was a rimless cartridge, of course, being used for a semi-automatic pistol. You want to avoid a rim on a semi-auto, so you avoid rim lock, but you want a rim on a revolver so your uh, casings do not fall through the cylinder. Now, the 1917 from Smith & Wesson was a little bit different from the Colt variation of the 1917 as there was a shoulder machined into the cylinder to prevent the 45 ACP casings from falling through. So you can actually use the Smith variation of the 1917 without a moon clip. A moon clip is a circular device that acts as a supplemental rim to the casings involved. The uh, early variations were actually a half moon clip. So essentially what you have is a ring here, I stopped myself and I grabbed one, but essentially you have a ring that you snap the necks of the casings into, and this whole unit, sorry about the focus, sits inside the revolver with your rounds attached to it to prevent them from falling through. And then when you're done, you tilt the revolver up on end, hit the ejector, and the whole unit will fall out. You can either discard, or if you're out on a static range, you can strip your rounds off and then reuse the moon clip. These were sold or issued with half moon clips, so it would be just be half of these where you had two of them so that the rounds could lay flat in an ammo pouch or something like that. Again, the advantage here on the 1917 from Smith is you did not need a moon clip, but after firing, you would have to use some sort of rod cleaning rod or something to punch the rounds out through the face. It was a six round capacity cylinder. Now these would actually be really, really popular on the commercial market after World War I. Uh, and they would come out with a version of the 45 rimmed so that commercial shooters could use it. They don't really have the ammunition today uh, that you can really find in any meaningful number. These would have the slab slide wood grips, a lanyard ring. They would be U.S. property marked, United States property here. U.S. Army model 1917 marked here on the bottom. This one is matching. Just a really, really cool revolver. Really, really cool piece of American U.S. service history. These were also used in some limited extent in World War II, again, as ancillary backup sidearms but by then predominantly 1911 production was up to par enough to where you really did not see many of these used in the Second World War, but they were used to a pretty good number in World War I. So really, really cool revolver. Now, price point wise, um, these in excellent condition top out at maybe just over $1,000 in very poor condition, you might find them around $300. Something like this is in original finish, you know, there's just probably about 70 to 80 percent bluing, a little bit of pitting up here. Something like this might be in about the six to seven hundred dollar price point, which is typically the type of condition you find these in. Again, remember this has been made uh, about a hundred years ago. So really, really cool revolver. Um, really, really classic. Not much else to say about it, but they are a lot of fun at the range. And again, if you do want to take one out and shoot it and just use your standard 45 ACP ammo, you can do that with or without the moon clips. But anyway, there it is, a Smith & Wesson Model 1917 U.S. Surface Revolver. All right, up next, I have another classic piece of U.S. American military history. This is the Springfield Model 1873 Trapdoor Rifle, whereas this one is actually the cavalry carbine variation with the 22-inch barrel and the saddle ring bar and ring here on the left-hand side. Now, the history here would actually begin during the Civil War when you had people running around shooting at each other with 58 caliber muzzle-loaded muskets. Now, at the time, you had self-contained cartridges coming onto the scene with things like the Henry Model 1860 chambered and the 44 rimfire. It was becoming very apparent to the U.S. military that the muzzle-loaded rifle is going to be a thing of the past and the new self-contained rifle cartridge was going to be the thing moving forward. In about 1965, the U.S. Ordnance Department, this would be headed up by Brigadier General uh, Alfred Terry, they would begin testing for a new replacement service rifle. And this test would include about 100 different uh, rifle designs, which would be submitted for testing, yet they would go with none of them. 
what they thought would be more ideal is to go ahead and take all of those muskets that were back in inventory and convert them into a self-contained rifle. And you came up with what was known as the early so-called Allen conversions. Allen was a uh, was an employee or a, a uh, I should say a uh, firearms technician, if you will, at Springfield Armory. So they employed him to come up with this conversion, which he did. And of course, you have the early Allen conversions chambering through the breach like this, a single shot configuration in 4570. Some time would go on until about 1872, they would come up with a proprietary design known as this, adopted in 1873 as the Springfield Model 1873 uh, trapdoor rifle. Again, chambered in 4570. A lot of people would ask, why would they come up with this when things like that same year, the Winchester Model 1873 and 4440 were actually on the scene? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one, uh, you didn't really have a lever action in a full-length rifle cartridge. The U.S. military always had the philosophy that it wanted the soldiers to have the precision and accuracy of, you know, a sniper, you know, to be able to shoot a an enemy uh, from hundreds, if not thousands of yards away. I'm being a little bit hyperbolic there. That philosophy would actually stay with the U.S. military all the way up into the early days of Vietnam when it would finally be replaced with something in the intermediate cartridge like a 5.56. But the whole philosophy of the Army of One type of uh, um, implementation of rifles, full power rifle cartridges, 308, 30.6, really would begin around this time. Um, other reasons, there's something like an 1873 is much more costly and time consuming to manufacture than something like this. Also, the Ordnance Department was always a proponent of not wanting uh, U.S. military personnel wasting and expending a lot of ammunition and war material. Again, that was a philosophy that was kept all the way up into the adoption of full automatic rifles like the M14 and then the M16 as well. So a lot of, there was really an evolutionary change with McNamara in the, uh, in the 1960s with uh, sort of the standard issue rifle philosophy. Anyway, that's kind of going off in a different vein. Now this would be replaced in the early 1890s by the uh, 3040 Krag, the Krag Jorgensen. Uh, and this really would never be used in any type of big wide scale service or war military operations or anything like that. So although a standard issue military service rifle was never really used in any kind of large scale operations. Uh, 3040 Krag, the Krag Jorgensen was used in like the Spanish American War and then it would get replaced with the 1903 Springfield and so on, the rest is history. Now, the full-length um, trapdoor carbines, or I'm sorry, the full-length trapdoor rifles, uh, typically go in around the $700 to $1,000 price point. Really pristine conditions can go beyond that. The cavalry carbines like this are actually pretty rare variations. There was an updated model in the, in the uh, 1880s, around 1886, so the early 1873s like this, and with the saddle ring and all that, command a little bit more money. And I see these, and this is a well-worn variation. Again, it's very, very old, well over 100 years. Um, you know, are bringing it around the $2,000 price point. So anyway, a really, really cool carbine. Really, really glad to get that in. And just trapdoor Springfields of any variety are just a cool thing to have. And if you use a really uh, soft shooting 4570, like a cowboy load or something, they are a blast to shoot at the range and definitely will still hold up today as long as it's still in good condition. So there you go. Okay, last but certainly not least is a very popular and very coveted AK around AK collector communities. This is the Polytech Legend, which is known against other Chinese variant AKs from the 1980s and 1990s. It's set apart by having the milled receiver. You can tell the milled receiver right away by the lightning cut right here, just rear of the trunnion. Um, the AK-47S Polytech Legend, the story here would actually begin in about 1987 when China would start importing into the United States from Norinco and Polytech semi-automatic variants of the AK or the Type 56 that had been used uh, in the Chinese military. Most notably like the Type 56 AK-47 or AKMs would have been used in the Vietnam War, but the uh, commercial variants, the S1, the S2, the S3, whether it was a fixed stock, an underfolder, side folder, uh, would be coming into the country and be very popular. Now the basic AKM pattern on the stamped receiver, which was most commonly brought in by Norinco, would have a retail price of around the $250 mark. Now these were some of the first AKs to come into the country. Prior to that you had the um, Amadi variants coming in. Uh, which were very, very expensive. You had the Valmet rifles coming in from Finland, which were also pricey. So these were the first price 
uh, you know, easily purchased and consumed AKs from the consumer market and they took off with a wide uh, amount of popularity. Now, shortly thereafter, Polytech would start bringing in the Legend, which was this on the milled receiver, and would have a commercial price around the $500 mark, so about twice what the stamped receiver variants would go for. Now, they actually sold with a lot of popularity, so it was clear that a lot of people in the AK collector community at the time, I guess it wasn't really a collector community, but people who were interested in the AK patterns did definitely have a large interest in the milled receiver AKs. And again, the traditional AK-47 would have been on a milled receiver. It was the AKM that was the stamped one. So it's a little bit more of a traditional and classic design. Now, they would have these in the fixed stock, the some spiker variations, and then the underfolder, which is what this one is here. Now, these would stay in prolific consumer use through the late 80s until 1989 when a Norinco variant, the Type uh, 56S1, would be used in a tragic event known as the Stockton Schoolyard Shooting in which five children were killed and about 30 others wounded and adults and that uh, horrible tragedy. But this would create a sort of national debate on whether or not things like this should be importable from foreign countries. Now, around the time, 1989, President Bush Sr. would enact the Sporting Clause or a Sporting Importation Ban where firearms could not come in from foreign, uh, foreign countries unless there was a sporting a purpose for the firearm here, in which case that put a quick end to the traditional configuration Polytech and Norinco AKs. Shortly thereafter, until 1994, uh, they would have the uh, uh, um, Norinco would come out with the Mac 90 starting in 1990, Mac known as Modified AK, with the big thumb hole stock and no muzzle brake and no bayonet lug and any of that to be more of a sporting rifle. And those would come in from 1990 to 1994 until the assault weapons ban when they would cease altogether and that would be the end of Chinese imported AKs. So these would actually only have been imported for three years, 87, 88, and 89, making them exceedingly rare on the market today and also exceedingly expensive. The traditional Norinco and Polytech stamped receiver AKs you'll find in about the two to $3,000 range in the Polytech Legend in really good condition. Right now they've exploded lately up to about the three to $4,000 range. So really, really expensive AKs because they are very collectible and very hard to find. Uh, this one's in beautiful condition. I mean, the bluing is probably 95 plus percent, a couple handling marks in the wood. Uh, non-original mag, but otherwise a really, really nice AK, uh, no box or anything like that, but just really, really cool. So always a great thing to get one of these in. Really happy to get this in to share it with you guys on the video. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel so you can see more content like this as we post it every week. Anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.